All righty. This is a fair warning. I think it is. I have an interesting sense of humor for those who don't know me too well. If I'm laughing or snickering, I'm either one, getting a picture image of something funny or not so funny. And or two, a little nervous either for you or for me. And by no means am I disrespectful of our Lord. If you find this offensive, then I suggest that you choose something else. Don't watch. Don't listen. It's just that simple. But something brought you here. And maybe you need to listen before it's too late. Good day, Paula Patio here, and today I want to talk to you about the judgment seat. Um, actually, there's seven judgments, and I've been saved for quite a while. Have I been walking the straight and narrow path? No. Am I perfect? <laughs> no. But this has always, always has been on the back of my mind. I mean, I'm looking forward to going home, but I am not looking forward to see where I messed up greatly, big time. Not looking forward to that at all. And you're going to hear hear about the details shortly. So let's begin. Now just so that you know, the book that I'm referring to, and and I I love this pastor. His name is Mark Hitchcock. It's from the Complete Book of Bible Prophecy. This guy is an end times expert, and I just love him. Mark Hitchcock. I love him. So right when we're raptured up, the first major event that will occur in heaven after the church has been raptured is the judgment seat of Christ. At the judgment seat, all believers from the church age, the time between the day of Pentecost and the rapture, will appear individually before God to receive rewards or loss of reward based on their lives, service, and ministry for the Lord. I want to be very clear on that. That is the first judgment. Now let's go into the second judgment. Oh, by the way, for the first judgment seat of Christ, you can look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. Okay, the second judgment, Old Testament believers, Daniel 12, 1 through 3, all Old Testament believers will be resurrected and rewarded after the second coming of Christ. Mm Mm-hmm. After the second coming of Christ. Number three, tribulation believers. Revelation 20, 4 through 6, those who trust Christ during the tribulation and die for their faith will be resurrected and rewarded at the end of the tribulation. That's right, at the end of the tribulation. Number four, Jews living at the second coming. That's Ezekiel 20, 34 through 38. All Jews who survive the tribulation will be judged in the wilderness right after the second coming. The saved will enter the kingdom and the lost will be purged. Mm. Number five, the sheep and the goats. That's Matthew 25, 31 through 46. All Gentiles who survive the tribulation will be judged right after the second coming. As Christ sits on his glorious throne, the saved will enter the millennial kingdom and the lost will be cast into hell. Hell is a real place. Number six, Satan and the fallen angels, Revelation 20 through 10. The final judgment of Satan and the fallen angels, demons, will take place after the millennial kingdom. After, okay? Number seven, the great white throne. This is Revelation 20, 11 through 15. The judgment of unsaved people will occur at the end of the millennium. They will be judged according to their works and cast into the lake of fire. The Bible is clear that God not only judges us according to our deeds, but rewards us as well. But you need to consider these passages, okay? There's Psalms 58, 11, 62, 12. There's Proverbs 11, 18. There's Isaiah 40, 10, 62, 11. There's Matthew 5, 12, 6, 1 through 2, 10, 41 through 42. There's also Luke 6, 35. There's 1 Corinthians 3, 8 and also 14. There's Ephesians 6, 8. There's Hebrews 10, 35 through 36, 11, 6, 24, 26. 2 John 1, 8. Revelation 2, 23, 11, 18. And also Revelation 22, 12. The judgment for church age believers will occur at what the Bible calls the judgment seat of Christ. Again, 2 Corinthians 5, 10. So let's talk about the when. 
the period of the judgment, the when. The judgment seat of Christ will occur in heaven immediately after Christ raptures the church. 1 Corinthians 4, 5 places this judgment right after the rapture. When the Lord comes, he will bring our deepest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. And then God will give to everyone whatever praise is due. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. Now, let's talk about the place of judgment, where it's going to be. Now, in ancient times, the judgment seat or bima seat refers to a raised step or platform, and it was set up for three major purposes. First, the judgment seat or bima was a court of justice where people came to have their grievances redressed. Now, I'm probably going to really hack up the name of what I want to share with you. The guy's name is Lucius Junius Gallio Aeneas, I guess. Anyways, also known as Galeo, G-A-L-L-I-O. Hey, if you read your Bible, you'll know who this guy is. In the book of Acts, he dismissed the charges brought by the Jews against the Apostle Paul, which is Acts 18, 12 through 17. Now, his behavior on this occasion showed his disregard for Jewish sensitivities and also the impartial attitude of Roman officials towards Christianity in its early days. Now, Galileo's tenure can be fairly accurately dated between 51 and 52 AD. He was in office for just a very short time. Therefore, the events of Acts can be dated to this period. How's that? And this is very significant because it is the most accurate known date in the life of Paul. Now I ask, how cool is that? I think that's pretty cool. Secondly, the judgment seat was a place in a military camp where the commander administered discipline and addressed the troops. And third, the judgment seat was the stand at the athletic games from which judges enforced the rules and distributed the rewards. This third picture, or this third scene or example, seems to be the primary backdrop for the judgment seat of Christ in the scriptures. The judgment seat of Christ is the place in heaven at after the rapture, where Christ will reward those who have finished the race and have obeyed the rules and will withhold reward from those who have been unfaithful. So let's talk about the participants of the judgment. The who. The judgment seat of Christ is for believers only. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul says, We must all stand before Christ to be judged. The context clearly indicates that he is referring to himself and other believers. Unbelievers will be judged by God at the great white throne of judgment. Every person who is hearing these words that I'm saying to you will appear at one of two great judgments. Believers will appear at the judgment seat to be rewarded, and unbelievers will appear at the great white throne to be condemned. Revelation 20, 11, 15. Let that sink in for a little while. Now this is pretty cool. The purpose of the judgment, the why. But before I get into that, I'm going to tell you what it is not. The purpose of the judgment seat of Christ is not to determine between, you know, believers whether they're going to go to heaven or hell or to, you know, met out punishment for the sin that we've committed. No, uh, but you're going to be kicking yourself in the butt. But anyway, putting that aside, (laughs) you're going to be happy, okay? You are definitely going to be happy. Now, this ultimate issue was already decided when believers put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior from sin. Okay, and a lot of people don't like that word sin. If you're familiar with archery, then you're going to know why people refer to not doing or being obedient as sin. Okay, and here's the reason why. In archery, if you don't hit the mark, which is the bullseye, it is called sin. So, you missed your mark, and everybody missed their mark. I've missed the mark many times. Thank you, Jesus, then I'm saved. Okay, but I know when I'm missing my mark. But, putting that aside, and if you want a list of sin, then why don't you go to Leviticus, um, where there's 613 of them. And a lot of people say, well, you know, now there's 10. Really? Really? (laughs) For those who put their faith in Jesus Christ as their savior from sin, because I'm a sinner, God's word is clear that his children will never 
be judged for their sins. John 5.24 says, I assure you, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death unto life. Romans 8.1 echoes this message. There is no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ. If we ever have one sin brought against us, Christ's work was incomplete. So our salvation rests wholly on one person and work of Christ in our place. Now, having said this, let's turn to the focus on the purpose of the judgment seat of Christ, which is twofold. In review is to reward. First, the Lord will review our life. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I guess to get a real good picture of what is like going through my head is there's this great movie that I love and it's called Defending Your Life with Albert Brooks and Meryl Streep. But I'm, I'm very disappointed with Meryl Streep, but she's an ex excellent actress in this movie. And this is not my perception of heaven, but yeah, I don't know. I could probably take a few things. It's, it's pretty cool. But um, you'll see in, in this movie where, you're, where, the, where the life is kind of like replayed. Now, for the past, I'd probably say maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years, I look at it as God, somebody's recording. <laughs> Somebody is recording, but, uh, you know, them kind of like looking down from heaven, you know, I'm probably laughing. They, they have to be laughing, like, oh my gosh, Polly, you're just such an idiot. <laughs> but I do come back to the path. You know, I might learn my lesson. I might. I mean, how many times does it take to learn a lesson? Sometimes it takes a lot of times to learn a lesson. But eventually, you know, you're on the right path. Eventually. Maybe by the time, well definitely when rapture hits i'll be on the right path definitely Woohoo! okay okay so let, let's get back on the path here having said all this um first the, um let's talk about the review to reward okay so first the lord will review our life <laughs> and his review will be perfectly fair impartial thorough and gracious he will review our conduct that is how we lived our life after we became a believer and as romans 14 10 12 says each of us will stand personally before the judgment seat of god for the scriptures say as surely as i live says the lord every knee will bow to me and every tongue will confess confess allegiance to god yes each of us will have to give a personal account to god second corinthians 5 10 adds we must all stand before christ to be judged we will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in our bodies. Oh boy. He will also review our service for him after we became a believer. There is going to come a time of testing at the judgment day to see what kind of work each builder has done. Everyone's work will be put through the fire to see whether or not it keeps its value. And that's 1 Corinthians 3.13. Now, our words will also be judged. We will have to give account for every word we have ever spoken. Oh boy, I'm going to bet in this day of technology, it goes for email messages and texts. Oh boy, oh boy, again. Hey, this is all new to me, okay? I tell you this, that you must give an account on Judgment Day for every idle word you speak. And that's Matthew 12, 36. Finally, he will review our thoughts and motives. <laughs> the all-knowing Lord will look at why we did what we did. This will be the most searching aspect of our evaluation. The following passages serve as a warning for us to keep our motives pure. Look, personally speaking, it's not easy. It is not easy being a Christian. It is not. Why? It's very important to repent constantly. You know, not beat yourself up, but, you know, repent. And at least you're aware of what you need to work on. 
So here's some passages that should encourage us and we need to keep them in mind. Take care. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired because then you will lose the reward from your Father in Heaven. When you give a gift to someone in need, don't shout about it as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I assure you, they have received all the reward they will ever get. And that's Matthew 6. 1 through 2. Here's another one. Be careful not to jump to conclusion before the Lord returns as to whether or not someone is faithful. When the Lord comes, he will bring our deepest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. 1 Corinthians 4 5. And here's another one. Nothing in all creation can hide from him. That's for sure. <laughs> Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. This is the God to whom we must explain all that we have done. And that's Hebrews 4.13. Yep, at the judgment seat, all of our conduct, service, words, thoughts, and motives will be turned inside out and will appear in their true light. Oh gosh. We can often fool other people about our service and our motives, and they may think we are doing some great thing for God, but we can't fool God. He knows what we do and why we do it, and he bases his rewards on the true estimation of our actions and attitudes. Many who believe will receive great reward, may walk away empty-handed, and vice versa. Remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 20.16. Many who are first now will be last then, and those who are last now will be first then. The second purpose is to receive our rewards. Those who have faithfully served the Lord and poured out their lives for Him will gain eternal rewards that they can never lose. While there are undoubtedly many areas of service, conduct, and ministry that will bring reward, the New Testament focuses on five specific rewards or crowns that the faithful will receive at the judgment seat. These crowns are representative of the kind of conduct and service that the Lord will reward. First of all is the incorruptible crown, and that's 1 Corinthians 9:24 through 27. The reward for those who constantly practice self-discipline and self-control. Number two, the crown of righteousness, and that's 2 Timothy 4:8. The reward for those who eagerly look for the Lord's coming and live righteous lives in view of this fact. Number three, the crown of life. James 1, 12 and Revelation 2, 10. The reward for those who faithfully endure and persevere under the trials and tests of life. Number four, the crown of rejoicing. First Thessalonians, I can't say that word. 2, 19. It, you know, I see it in my head. I could say it in my head, but I can't say it out loud. Anyway, yep, 2, 19. The reward for those who win people for Christ. And number five, the crown of glory. That's 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. The reward for those pastors, elders, and church leaders who lovingly and graciously shepherd and oversee God's people. (sighs) Well, I have a comment in reference to that with some of the people that I've crossed paths with that, hmm, Anyway, one question that you may have at this point is, what will we do with the crowns? Well, will we wear them around the streets of gold or show them off? I'd like a little tiara. (laughs) I really would. I would like a little tiara. But that's okay. Uh, No. Again, the Bible is clear. After receiving these rewards at the judgment seat in heaven, the redeemed will fall down in front of the throne and worship the Lord. And they will lay their crowns at his feet and sing his praise for his worth and honor. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created everything. And it is for your pleasure that they, meaning us, exist and were created. And that's Revelation 4, 10 through 11. In humble gratitude, the redeemed will cast their crowns at his feet of the Redeemer, the only one who is worthy of glory, power, and honor. 
In addition to those crowns, the other main reward a faithful will receive is responsibility and authority in the coming kingdom. This is what I live for, ruling and reigning. I really and truly do. This present age is training time for reigning time. Believers will occupy various positions of authority in the kingdom based on how we live our life here on earth. And see Luke 19, 13 through 26. I really didn't want to go this long, but it is what it is. And <laughs> the spirit just moved me. So until next time, hey, have a great week. Lord's coming back real soon. He is. And the music today is brought to you by Ben Sound. Ben Sound dot com.